Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, I'm purchased of God. I'm born of His Spirit, oh, I'm washed in His blood. And I can't stop singing You have brought- 
us, Lord. God, and we offer up songs of worship and praise unto your name today because you alone are holy, you alone are worthy, you alone are God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. Amen, amen. He is holy. He is good. Amen. Let's go to him in prayer today. Amen. Many needs. People are in need of a touch, but we know the God who is the healer. Lord Jesus, we love you today. Lord, we come to you, God, humbly, Lord. We come to your throne, Lord. God, we also come boldly, Lord. God, bringing these requests to you, Lord. We ask you to reach down, Lord, and God, touch these needs, Lord. God, you know every need, Lord. Phyllis and Maddie, James, Lynette, Jason, Lord, Gary, the Alexanders, Brother Wilbur, Lord, Evelyn, God, and Israel, Lord. God, they're not hid from you. You. Lord, you knew about it before we came in, Lord. But God, in obedience to your word, you said, cast your cares, cast all our cares on you, Lord. God, so we cast these people, Lord. God, these needs on you. And we ask you, Lord, to reach forth your hand, Lord, even now, God, and work a miracle, Lord. God, work a miracle of healing, of restoration, God, in their bodies, in their minds, oh, Lord, in their spirits. Everybody said amen. amen. Hallelujah. There's something about ending a prayer with amen. Amen. You know, that, that's the period that you put, you put the cap on it. Lord, we ask you to do all this, and then you say amen. It is so. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Amen. It's good to know that when we go to God with all our needs, that we can put that it is so. Amen. That's faith. Believing that once we ask it, he said, if you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. And so thank God. Welcome to the Pentecostal Church of Atascacita on a Sunday morning. Amen. And thank God for the rain that we got this week. Amen. It's a good week and it's a good day to be in church. If you're a visitor, we're so glad that you've come to be with us this morning. And at this time, we'd like to receive our Sunday morning tithe and offering. Bow your heads. Lord Jesus, we come to you today, Lord. We bring our tithes. Lord, that first 10% that belongs to you, Lord, we bring it to you, God. We bring the first fruit to you. Lord, you said if the first fruit's holy, God, then the, all of it will be holy, Lord. God, bless it. Bless the offering. Bless the tithe. Bless your people, Lord. Keep your hand upon your church, God. Give us revival in these last days. In Jesus' name, amen. You may bring your offering and shake somebody's hand.
blood runs through our veins. Your kingdom triumphs over even the cold.
come alive in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. We bring everything to the feet of Jesus. Everything in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. Come alive in the name of Jesus. Come alive in the name of Jesus. Come alive in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. Everything to the feet of Jesus. Everything in the name of Jesus. This is a new day. It's fresh. It's new. The mercies of the Almighty God are fresh and new on this day. And you have no idea what God may do for you this day. Our minds said the old way of the carnal flesh is okay, another place to go, another activity, another song service, another time of preaching. But 
this morning I ask you, allow God to take your mind beyond your box. Come on. Let him take you beyond. Let him take your faith beyond. Let him take you out of your box and to the place where God is. God says he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you can ask or that you can think. And then he said it's according to that which works in you and that is your willpower. Amen. Amen. So the question this morning is will you? Will you let God take you to his place? Come on. Come on. Do you believe that today a miracle can happen today? That, that a circumstance can totally change that has been a huge wall before you? That it can totally change? Come on. That's all through the word of God. That's why we preach the word of God. Come on. That your faith will become activated and you will believe. You will believe. You will believe and then you will receive the things of God. Come on. I can tell you stories of miracles in my life where God did move mountains. That can happen to you today. It can happen for you today. God is a miracle working God. And today he created. It's a brand new day. Amen. that God speaks to you and every time God speaks to me I, I, I just get up and start speaking what I feel the Lord spoke to me and one of the things that when, when we was worshiping and I don't know for who or what but they brought my mind back into the Old Testament where it talked about they, they had dug wells and that was their source of, of water and then it talks about how the enemy came in and would fill in those wells. Try to shut them off from their source. And I don't know why, but I'm going to say what the Holy Ghost spoke to me today. Somebody needs to get your shovel out and redig. What the Lord tried to stop, I'm sorry what the devil tried to stop up. Somewhere in your life, that well was flowing. Yes. But then the enemy comes in and tries to feel it. Right. Instead of us accepting that and then dying because we've lost connection to the well or the water. You know, I, I, like I say, God shows me things. You know what I've seen? I've seen military man with those little shovels on the back <laughs> and I didn't come in here thinking about that Why, you know it just something like that pops into your mind you just say okay God you <laughs> amen you need to look at yourselves as a bunch of military folks with a shovel on your back and you need to redig the well just cause the devil filled it up with dirt you lost connection to something a long time ago. This morning you need to say, I'm pulling my shovel out and I'm going to redig my way. I'm going to get down to that water source and it's going to bring life unto me because the Spirit of the Lord said, with joy, we shall drink from the wells of salvation. With joy, we shall drink from the wells of salvation. Come on. The devil tried to take your joy away. Get your shovel out and dig back down in that well and get the dirt out and get to the waters of life again. Come on, it is a new day. It is a new day for the church and we are living in the end time generation. Hallelujah. God's church is not going to be a crippled church. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, does anybody say today? Today, 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 God. Today, I'm going to get into that well. I'm going to receive from the strength that comes. And I'm going to receive a miracle of God's strength and overcoming power. And the joy of the Lord is going to be my strength. Get up, 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 get up,
filled in. Dig. Dig. The joy of the Lord is my strength. With joy I shall drink from the wells of salvation. Praise God. Well, I got to get out of the way. We got a preacher here today. Good to have the pedagogues with us. Amen. Savannah, she's no stranger at all to me. We've been in Atascacita for now 21 years. How old are you? 22? Sister McKee's granddaughter. Amen. Great to have the pedagogues with us. Brother Pedago, thank you all for putting us on your calendar and schedule to be with us today. And uh, they're going to be back tonight. So. Come back, 6 o'clock, church begins. We still have church on Sunday nights around here, so amen. Hallelujah. Brother Pedigo, Sister Pedigo, God bless you. Thank y'all for being with us today. Come on up. Whatever y'all feel in the Holy Ghost, amen. Sing, preach, just whatever you feel. That's what we want today. Amen. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Oh, come on now. Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. It's Sunday morning. Somebody ought to be thankful. Now, I got to tell you, there's a lot of other places we could be. There's a lot of other things you could be doing on Sunday morning. Other people are at sporting events. Uh, other people are taking naps right now. Uh, I'm sure other people were grilling, but at the end of the day, there's not a sporting event, there's not a hamburger, and there's not an amount of naps that could give me as much rest as the presence of God can, amen? I wonder, is there anybody who is thankful for the presence and the glory of God, right? There's a lot of things that I, I, I should be doing right now that I deserve to be doing. I deserve to be on my way to hell, right? I deserve to be in a sinner's place, but God stepped down and offered me a place in his presence. Everyone in this house has been offered a space in the yeah. presence of God. It is good to be in the house of God on Sunday morning. Amen. My name is, uh, my name is Georgian Pedigo. Nice to meet you all. If I haven't got the chance to shake your hand, I look forward to it. And uh, uh, Brother Martin is right. Thank you so much, Brother Martin, Sister Martin, for allowing us to be with your amazing church. Everybody, we walked in here. And one of the first things we said is like, well, everybody here is just the kindest person we've met. You guys have been incredible. Y'all know how to make people feel welcome here. That's right. Give yourselves a hand clap. It's a healthy sign in the body of Christ if it's easy to be kind to people, right? You guys have been amazing. I'm honored and blessed to have my wife here, Savannah. Now, you guys know her. And uh, again, she doesn't need an introduction, but it's just fun for me to talk about her. You know what I'm saying? That's my privilege. It's my honor to get to talk about her. And she is one of the most anointed uh, worship leaders that I know. 
and I have always been blessed by her ministry in that realm. So she's going to sing for us here for a little bit. And I, I would encourage you today, let's not just go through the motions. We could let this be like any other Sunday, but I really believe that God is digging for someone's heart today. From what I have to preach to what she has to sing to what Brother Martin's already said, God is reaching for someone's mind. He's reaching for someone's soul. He's reaching for someone's heart. And I would hate to let a service go by where God was knocking on the door of my heart and get so busy on the inside of the house that I didn't take time to open the door and said, God, work on me. God, show me your glory. Show me what you need from my heart today. Show me how you want to change me. I don't want to let a Sunday go by and let your glory pass by my house. Jesus. Praise the Lord, y'all. You can be seated if you want to be seated. If you feel like standing, stand. If you feel like sitting, sit. But all morning, as long as uh, my husband was saying, all right, it was we with the in-ear and for a second, I couldn't hear. <laughs> y'all. Uh, I just feel like there's something that God wants to do in this service, a little beyond what we're used to, a little out of our comfort zone. Uh, it's so easy to come in service after service, especially when you've been in church for a long time or you haven't, to go through the motions, right? You get used to doing things a certain way, singing the songs, when we're supposed to sing the songs, hearing the preaching, coming to the altar when the altars are open. But I believe God wants to do a new thing in the next few minutes. He wants to restore joy in someone's soul. He wants to speak things into your life. He wants to revive things that were once dead. He wants to give strength to everyone that is weary. And he wants to confirm things. He wants to remind you that he hasn't forgotten your promise. He wants to speak to you in a personal way. And if you would open yourself up to that and say, God, I want you to do something in my life that you've never done before. God, I want to hear your voice in a way that I've never heard you speak before. God, I want to see your glory in a way that I've never seen your glory before. I'm not satisfied with the ordinary. I'm not satisfied with the ordinary things, God. I want to see your glory. So I'm gonna sing a chorus that's familiar to a lot of you. How many of you know the chorus that just says, Show us your glory, show us your glory. In wonder and surrender we fall down. When we sing that in the next few minutes, I don't want this just to be me up here singing at you, right? Me singing and you be in it, being entertained by it. I want everyone in this room to sing those lyrics out and make it personal. And I want you to invite God into this room and say, God, I'm desperate. I want to see your glory. I can't leave this place the same way that I came, God. I can't leave this place the same way that I came. I want to see your glory in a new way. We need you, God. Everybody say, show us your glory. Show us your glory, show us your glory. In wonder and surrender we fall down. Show, show us your glory, show us your glory, God. Let every burning heart be holy ground. Something shifting in the atmosphere. Show us your glory, show us your glory, in wonder and surrender we fall down. Show us your glory, show us your glory, God. Let every burning heart be holy ground, cause chains You change everything in lives healed and hope is found right here, right now. Jesus, you change everything. Change fall and fear, fear has to bow.
God fill the room Angels are at every corner Right now when you fill the room God fill this room And everything that's dead comes alive When he fills
Don't let this moment pass you by. Just come on, you weary. Come on, if someone's weary and you need rest, there's the presence of God here in this room. He's been waiting for every child of his to walk through this door on a Sunday and said, God, I cannot handle the things that I've been trying to carry anymore, Lord. Can I minister to somebody? It was never yours to carry in the first place. The trials, the shame, the, the worries, the cares that you are holding in your hands were never meant for you to carry in the first place. We serve a God who is the only one who ever offered to carry you, your burdens, your worries, your struggles. In the name of Jesus. Drink from the Jesus name. That won't run dry. Don't let this pass us by, Jesus. Don't let this moment. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Pass you by. Amen. Can we all just lift our hands before we pray and we even get to the word of God? Jesus, open up my spirit. If your presence is in this room, Lord God, don't let me pass it by. Lord God, open my mind. Open my heart, open my spirit to what you would have to say today, Lord God. Let your word cleanse us, Lord God. Let it move on us, Lord God, and do something different today. If your presence is in this room, and it is, Lord God, don't let it pass me by. But open my heart, open my mind, and speak to me. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. If you will turn with me to Psalms 56. We're going to go out of Psalm 56 today. Thank you, Savannah, for leading us in worship. Thank you, worship team, earlier for leading us into the presence of the God. Um, we either believe that he's a miracle working God or we don't. Right. Amen. We either walk into church and believe that we're in the presence of God and that miracles happen in his house. If it's a house of prayer, a house of worship, we either believe that the presence of God can do it all or we don't. So when we walk in service after service and tell God, it's all right, God, I want to feel the peace in your presence, but I still want control of the situation. We're telling God, I don't trust you enough to handle it on your own. So I'm still going to try to control just a little bit of it. But can I tell you, the peace of God starts when you let go of what you're holding. When you trust something bigger than yourself, that's where the peace of God begins. Because the more you try to hold it, the less peace you will have. And God is trying to crawl his way into someone's heart today saying, there's so much peace, there's so much joy, there's so much glory that I am willing to show you. You just have to open your hands and let go of the situation. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, brother and sister Martin, for allowing this opportunity. Psalms 56. Be merciful unto me, O God, for man would swallow me up. He fighting daily oppresseth me. This is David on his way to Gath. He's been taken by the Philistines and he is on the run from Saul. He's in the wilderness and he is now being taken by the men of Gath and he's being taken to their capital. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. In God I will praise his word. In God I put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Every day they rest my words. Their thoughts are against me for evil. They gather themselves together. They hide themselves. They mark my steps when they wait for my soul. Shall they escape by iniquity? In thine anger cast down the people, O God. And right here in verse 8 is where I want to base the text out of today. Is Thou tellest my wanderings. Put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? Psalms 126, 5 through 6. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. For though uh, he that goeth forth weeping, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. In the name of Jesus, with his help, in the next couple of minutes, I just want to preach on a very simple subject. I'm not very long-winded. So somebody say amen. If you'll preach with amen. me, we'll be done a lot quicker. Somebody say amen. It's all right. And uh, the power of a crybaby. The power of a crybaby. You may be seated. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord God. Amen, amen. Everybody doing okay? Amen. It's all right. We're in the, we're in the presence of God. It's okay. Relax a little bit. We're in, we're in church. This is a safe place, by the way. Amen. Now, the power of a crybaby. Here's David. He's in the wilderness. Now, we usually see David as this conquering king, but if you read through the Psalms, many times you will see David as he cries before God because of the trouble that he is in, right? 
And so what, what is there any power in a crybaby? Has anyone ever, ever heard the phrase like, oh, my word, they're crying again? You all have like a friend or like a family member? Now, I'm not, don't raise your hand and don't point at them or anything like that. But yeah, y'all, in school, in, in church, sometimes you have that one friend in the group, you have that one family member, and it don't matter what's happening, they're, they're crying. You turn around and like, it, everyone in the room could be happy, and you turn around and they're so happy they are, they're crying because they're so happy. And this doesn't matter. You've got that one crybaby in your friend, and if you can't think of one, it's probably you. And uh, you're, you're probably the crybaby in your group, Right? What is the power of a crybaby? I, I, I'll be very honest and transparent with you. I, I'm a crybaby. My wife knows this. Um, I can't hardly get on Facebook. And uh, sometimes I've been caught in an hour's worth of tears. You know why? Because I'll watch pregnancy announcement videos. We're not pregnant. We're not anywhere close to being pregnant. But somehow if I spend 45 minutes watching people tell other people they're pregnant and people get so happy, I will sit there for 45 minutes and sob my eyes out because I think it's so sweet, right? Uh, the, the military coming home videos, anyone ever been caught in one of those? Oh, I, somebody in this, oh, yes. Don't show me a military coming home video. I will cry my eyes out. I used to cry at everything. As a child, I was kind of a sensitive kid, and I would cry. I would cry if I became overwhelmed. In fact, uh, I'm not good with numbers. I'm not good at math. So anytime that I was given a timed math test, usually I would become so overwhelmed that they would hear sniffles from the back of the room, and they would look up, and I was literally weeping over my math test. They're like, what's wrong, pal? I'm like... I just don't know what it means, you know, and I'm just, I'm sobbing because I, I don't know math and I would become overwhelmed. I was a sympathetic crier. If I would, I had secondhand embarrassment. So if I felt like something awkward was happening or somebody was embarrassed, uh, I would feel just as much embarrassment and then I would begin to cry because I felt so bad for them, right? Has anyone ever felt these things? We all at some point in our life have cried, right? Uh, it's genetic. My dad's a crybaby. My grandfather was a crybaby. We'll cry at just about anything. Uh, we just, we're criers. And uh, usually in society, this is seen as something that's weak or undesirable, right? Crybabies are seen as you, you'll never get anything done. You'll never progress in life because you're too busy crying about everything. You, you, you got you to gotta get thicker skin. You got to toughen up. You got to get past this thing because crying is going to get you nowhere. But yet we all cry. At one point or another, everyone in this room has cried, whether you were an infant, whether you were a child. At this moment, it doesn't matter if you're a crier now. I know there's many people who say, well, I've never shed one tear. I'm like, I bet you just don't remember, because I guarantee you, as soon as you were a baby and you got hungry enough, you cried for something, right? At every moment in a human being's life, you have cried at least one time in your life. And the average, uh, the average human being actually cries uh, 15 to 30 gallons of tears per year. 15 to 30 gallons of tears a year pour out of the eyes of human beings, right? And yet, that is seen as shameful. Can you imagine if you were holding 15 to 30 gallons of water and were trying to hide that from people? Imagine that. Imagine just the sight of someone holding 15 to 30 gallons of water and yet trying to hide it in a closet some way, trying to pack it away, sweep it under the rug, because it would be embarrassing to let anybody know that you cry. It's humiliating. It's not strong. Grown people don't cry. I remember I, I was a, I was an interesting. I was a sensitive kid, but I used to cry all the time. And then when I started getting older, I, I found a way from getting away from crying. Is if I got overwhelmed in a situation, or if I felt awkward, if I felt intimidated or scared, oftentimes I learned that if I would just act goofy or act crazy, and I would start to tell jokes, then all of a sudden it would make people laugh. And making people laugh diffused the situation for me. And so it was a way for me to operate socially without feeling overwhelmed, without feeling scared of everyone around me. And so I kind of became the class clown. Uh, you know, in my middle school, we got away with a lot of stuff we shouldn't have got. My, my English teacher made a mistake. She told me that I reminded her of her son. She never should have told me that. Because right then I said, ooh, I can get away with anything in this class because she'll look at me and say, that's my little boy. And I'm like, we can do whatever. We actually uh, acted out a, a full human sacrifice in my English class. And we, we, did all, we did all types of pranks on my English teacher, and we usually got away with it. But I kind of became this class clown. But the problem was is that I, I, was, I got really good at making people laugh. I got really good at doing crazy stuff. And I got really good at putting on this face 
that everything was okay and everything was all right and people would come and they would want to pour out their problems. But when I was having a bad day, when I was struggling, when my heart was in pain and my soul was in pain, I didn't have anybody to talk to because I was the guy who had it all together. I was the one who made people laugh. I was the guy who was not responsible for crying. I was not the one who was supposed to be in need. I was just the one who you you put a quarter in, he tells a joke, and we make people laugh. And I'm wondering how many of us walk into the presence of God like this, right? Crying is a weakness, and therefore it would signify to other people that I don't have it all together. So I will walk in Sunday after Sunday, and I will walk in Wednesday after Wednesday, and I'll put a smile on my face. I will raise my hands, and I'll say, praise the Lord, and I'll go through whatever I have to go through because I will not be weak in front of my brethren. I will not be weak in front of other people. Therefore, I refuse to let them see me cry. Never let them see you cry. You see, we're kind of like David. David, we usually want to think of him as the guy who defeated Goliath, right? We want to see him as this conquering king. He's great, he's mighty, he's powerful. Then why can you read the Psalms if he's really this mighty conquering king? If he's really this person who, who, could, who could do all these amazing things as a warrior? He was wise, he was strong, he was athletic. He could get all this stuff done and yet we see his writings and I'm sure that all of his men would see him in the battlefield but in his private times with God, you see him pouring out his soul and pouring out of his eyes saying, God, I have no clue what's going on and I don't know what's happening. I'm crying, God, because this is not what you promised me. You see, David was anointed king over Israel when he was just a boy. And yet it took him decades to make it to the throne of Israel. Why? Because he was cast out by his father-in-law. His father-in-law tried to murder him. He lost his wife. He had to go on the run. He was in caves. He was sleeping in the wilderness. And he was nowhere close to the throne. You see, God had promised David a place of authority, a place of peace, a place of, a place of control. And yet, he was anointed with that place of control. And yet, he was so far away from it. He couldn't see it. He couldn't hold it. He couldn't touch it. And he's so far away from that place of control. And yet he's in the wilderness now in the hands of his enemies. Just years before, he had destroyed Goliath, right? He had, by the grace of God and by the mercy and the power of God, he had defeated Goliath, who was the champion of Gath, the Philistines. And now he is in the hands of the Philistines on his way to the capital. And he has no clue what's about to happen. He knows God made a promise he was supposed to be a king, but now he's in the hands of the very people that he killed their champion just a couple of years ago. And he's saying, surely I'm going to go into the presence of the king of Gath and the king of the Philistines, and he's going to just take my head off because I'm their enemy. God, what is happening here? You promised me peace. You promised me joy. Then why do I feel so miserable? And he began to cry unto God. And then he offers up this one line. He said, but God, I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Why? He said, because you've been too good to me before that I refuse to think that whatever's on the other side of this issue I'm dealing with presently is outside of your control. He said, I know that I'm in the midst of my enemies and I know that they're, they're, they're thinking against me, they're talking against me, they're doing things against me, yet, God, I, I'm gonna keep worshiping you, I'm gonna keep loving you, I'm gonna keep getting closer to you because it doesn't matter what happens, you know what's in control. And then he says, tell us my wanderings, thou tell us my wanderings, meaning, God, you know where I'm at, you see every place that I'm going, you know all the caves I've had to sleep in, you know all the wilderness I've had to walk through, and it says, and you put my tears into your bottle and are they not in thy book meaning you have taken record of every time a tear has been shed from my eyes you've written it down every time that I was overwhelmed every time that I was scared every time that I was weak God you didn't cast me out you didn't beat me up you didn't chastise me for crying God yet you took every record of every tear and you wrote them down because you said I'm going to recompense it one day I'm going to keep a hold of it as a testimony because well, at the end time when I, you come and you see this bottle full of tears and you read the records of your struggles they cannot be compared to the glory that I will shed out in your life David It'll be 
so much greater. It'll be so much more blessing. Now, let's talk about the science of tears, right? There are three different types of tears. There's basal tears. These are tears that just simply keep your eyes uh, watered, basically. It keeps them uh, humidified, right? And then there's also uh, reflexive tears. Reflexive tears happens when you ever got a piece of dust in your eye or an eyelash that gets inside your eye and it makes you cry. Right? Those are called reflexive tears. It's just to get foreign objects out of the eye. But there's one more type of tear, and it's called emotional tears. Now, scientists have done all types of studies on the other types of tears. Basal tears serve a purpose, right? It's just to keep the eye humidified. It's for the, the health of the eye. And reflexive tears work to protect the eye from foreign objects. And yet, scientists cannot find a reason for emotional tears. It's the only type of tear that scientists just can't figure out and explain. Now, they've tried many types of ways, and there's many different things about the science of tears. You know that these types of tears are different. And they said that the only thing that we could reckon is that these tears operate on a different level that we can't understand fully. But number one, do you know that uh, tears are used primarily to get attention, Right? What does a baby do when it cries? It's calling out to somebody more powerful than itself. Babies come into the world vulnerable. They come into the presence of other people vulnerable. They, they don't have what it takes to grow themselves. They don't have what it takes to feed themselves. They don't have what it takes to take care of themselves. And yet they cry out because why? Because I know mom and dad are out there somewhere and, and I'm hungry or something's wrong. And if I can cry out to mom and dad, then they'll hear me and they'll run to me, and they'll take care of me. I can't do it on my own. Tears are supplemented to grab the attention of someone greater than ourselves. That's what an emotional tear does. It calls for something greater than yourself to get something that you cannot get yourself. But an interesting thing to note is that as we grow older, we may lose the need to vocalize our cries, and yet the number of tears produced increases meaning as babies grow, they will actually not speak out loud, but the number of tears they cry increases, meaning as we grow older, we, we, we lose the object of actually crying out. We lose not the ability, but we lose the need to actually vocalize our problems, our issues, what we need, and we become more self-sufficient. And yet, when we come to moments of trial and moments of distress, we refuse to cry out because that would make me weak. That would mean that I can't control what's going on here. And yet there's something that's still stirring on the inside of our heart and on our soul that's affecting us. And it starts to pour out from our eyes and it begins to roll down our face. And yet we're still so scared to cry out. Can I tell you, one of the purposes of your tears is because your heavenly father takes notice of your tears. There's not a human being in this room who can feed themselves spiritually. There's not a human being in this room who can get what they need from the supernatural without God, all right? So when you find yourself in a moment of temptation, when you find yourself in a moment of trouble, you better let the tears flow. You know why? I need to learn how to cry out to God. Why? Because I need help from my Savior. I need help from God. I can't do this on my own. God is keeping a record of every tear you've ever cried. He sees every struggle you go through. He sees every situation you face. And yet he's saying, child, if you'll learn just to open up your mouth and if you'll learn to cry unto me, I will hear you and I will deliver you. I will make a way. See, tears are to get the attention of your father, to get the attention of God. Number two is that tears initiate social bonding between human beings. It's a proven study that when we see people cry, something happens on the inside of us and sympathy takes place, empathy takes place. And all of a sudden it starts to bring human beings together. When you see somebody crying, there's something, there should be something on the inside of you that says, I need to know what's wrong. Can I help you? Can I take care of you? Is there something I can do for you? Do you know that emotional tears actually have more proteins uh, in them than other types of tears, which means they become more viscous, meaning they're stickier, which means they run down your face slower. Other types of tears will run right off your face, but emotional tears, they hang around just a little bit longer. They're a little bit thicker. They, they contain a little bit more sorrow. You know why? Because it maximizes the amount of time they will spend on your face, maximizing the opportunity for somebody else to see it and come to your aid. And yet... We tell ourselves, I don't want to cry. I don't want them to see me cry. And we shut ourselves off from help. Can I tell you, God has created this wonderful body of believers. It's, it's called the church. 
It's called the body of Christ. And can I tell you, there's not one person in here who can do it without your brother or your sister. When, 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 when they were building the wall, when they were out of captivity in uh, the Old Testament, right? You have, uh, you have Zerubbabel. They went out and they began to uh, build the wall. And uh, they become to come out and they say these one things. And as they were building the wall, they said, you know what? Here's my thing. You've got to fight with a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other, right? They had enemies who were trying to keep Israel from rebuilding the wall. And so he said, first of all, we're going to give no place to the enemy enemy in this kingdom, which means no one's going to get on the inside and hurt anybody in this kingdom. This is God's kingdom, and our enemies don't have a place here. He said, so guess what? As we're rebuilding the wall, our enemies are going to come and attack us, but we're going to fight with one hand, and we're going to build with the other. It's not going to stop in the progression of what God wants to do in this church. It's not going to stop the progression of what God wants to do in this kingdom. We're going to keep building, and we're going to keep fighting, and yet he said one more thing. He said, now, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, I want you to drop what you're doing, and I want you to run towards your brother. Because that means somebody is in trouble and they need your help. Now, each person was placed along the wall to build their own section of the wall, to build their own uh, the house around their family, yes? And when they heard the sound of the trumpet, they had an option. They could say, well, wow, that, I really hate that for them over there as they're building their section of the wall, right? I really hate that for them over there as they're building their section of the kingdom. But if I don't take care of my side of the wall, it won't be as perfect. It won't be as nice. It won't be as... It won't be as great, right? I'm over here working on my segment of the wall. And I understand that they're in trouble over there and that the trumpet's sounding and my brother and my sister's in trouble, but I, I'm responsible for this side of the wall. This is my ministry. This is my household. This is what I'm trying to build. And yet there's somebody crying. Can I tell you? They said, no, drop what you're doing. When somebody hears the cry of a brother or a sister, Holy Ghost filled, church members should say, hey, guess what? I see that you're in pain and I want to pray for you. I want to minister unto your need. I can see that you're in trouble. I can see that something's happening that's outside of your control. Let me pray for you. Let me touch your life. Let me seek after God for on your behalf. I would that some believers would say, guess what? I don't care if it makes me look silly. I don't care if it makes me feel weird. If I see a brother or a sister in trouble, uh, can I pray for you? Can I talk to you? That person in the grocery line has been waiting for someone to ask for prayer for weeks and weeks and weeks. Be the one that says, can I help you? Can I pray for you? Can I reach out for you? Because tears signify that whatever's going on on the inside of my life is greater than what I can handle. Therefore, I need an outside source greater than myself to fix my problem. And therefore, we cry. The last point is that tears often bring humiliation or embarrassment. And that's the reason we avoid them. It's because crying tears and letting somebody know that I'm struggling would be embarrassing for me. That means what I, I wouldn't get to go to church and shake people's hands and go home unchanged. It means I, I, wouldn't, have to, I wouldn't have to let people know I'm actually going through a struggle or through an issue or through a problem. It, it would let people know that I'm weak. It would let people know that I'm tired. It would let people know that I, I, I'm not all put together and therefore I don't cry. You know, crying embarrasses us. But it also, science states that when we observe someone who cries, we actually observe them as more trustworthy and more dependable. Why? Because they were vulnerable. Because they admitted, I'm going to tell you the truth. I love you, but things are not going so great in my life. I know I've been coming and I've been putting on a smile and I've been putting on a good face and I, I've been telling you everything's all right. But can I be honest with you, the past couple of weeks have been pretty rough and everything's not really going all that well. You know, I can keep putting a, a good face on, I, and I can keep coming to church, but I got to tell you, things are not going so well, and all of a sudden that person says, hey, it's okay. It's not embarrassing. It's not rude to tell me your problems. It's not rude. That's why we're here. That's why we're the body of Christ. In fact, I love you, and I'm going to pray for you right now. There was an interesting moment in Luke 7 where Jesus is, is preaching, and there's a Pharisee that invites him into his house. Uh, to eat with him. And as Jesus goes in, it was a, a, a place of uh, hospitality, right? This Pharisee has all this money. He has all this prestige. And he wants to invite Jesus into his house so that he can talk to Jesus. He wants to host this great prophet, this great teacher, this great master. He wants to host him. And as Jesus goes to eat with this grand Pharisee who made a big deal out of having Jesus over to his house, in the middle of the dinner, something crazy happened. And there was a woman who ran into the building, who ran into the house. And she fell across the feet of Jesus and she began to weep tears. 
And she began to cry, and she began to cry over his feet, and she anointed Jesus' feet with her tears, and she dried them with her hair. She was desperate. She needed something from God. There were other people in the house, and surely it was embarrassing for her to run in front of everybody to get down to the feet of Jesus. It may have been embarrassing. She had to admit that she didn't have it all together. She had to admit that there was something wrong in her life, and she needed help. And yet here she is, weeping and sobbing over the feet of Jesus and drying his feet with her hair. And she didn't care what she looked like. She didn't care what she was doing. She didn't care what anyone else thought of her. She just needed to touch the Savior who could touch her life. And the Pharisee said, he said, in his mind, he began to think, he said, now, if Jesus really understood what this lady had done and who she was, he wouldn't even speak to her. You see, she was a woman who had a bad reputation. She had lived in sin. She had done so many things that the whole community knew what her problem was, knew what her sins were, knew what she was going through. And that's why they avoided her. That's why they wouldn't talk to her. But here's the Savior who can redeem her, who can save her, who can use her, who can change her life. And he lets her weep upon his feet. And this guy's saying, well, if he really knew who she was and what she'd been through, he wouldn't even, that's embarrassing. Ooh, that's embarrassing for her to cry in front of Jesus like that. Ooh, it's embarrassing for her to approach an altar like that and deal with that, what she's dealing with. And sometimes that's just intimidating us. There's some people in this room, you've been trying to approach the altar in a very specific way because you know you need Jesus. You know God wants to change something in your life. And yet you're so intimidated because you feel like everyone around you has it together. And man, it would be embarrassing for me to have to get up in that altar and get down on my face and cry before the feet of the master. It would be embarrassing for me to break down right in the middle of worship and show God that I really don't have it together and that my life is a mess and that the devil's been tempting my mind, my heart, and my spirit and my mind's been all messed up, my heart's been all messed up, and it would be embarrassing for me to go up there in front of all these people who have it together. And Jesus turned around. He said, let me ask you a question. He said, if there was a man who had 500 uh, 500 talents and 50 talents, and the master forgave both, which one would be more thankful he said, well, I suppose that the person who was forgiven 500 talents had been, would be more thankful. And he said, exactly. He said, I didn't come to save the people who didn't need my help. He said, I came to seek the lost, the dying, the sick. He said, I came to hear and to heal the problems of my children. It's not embarrassing to me when my child reaches out to me and says, Father, I need your help. It's not embarrassing to me when you come before my presence and said, God, I love you. I'm not perfect. I got things messed up. But there's something in your presence that I need. There's a peace. There's a joy. There's a power that I need in my spirit, in my heart, and in my soul. Something has got to change. And so Jesus said, rise. You're forgiven of your sins. He forgives her and he redeems her. Can I tell you, God sees your tears. I I don't know who's in this place. And I I can't see the tears that you cry. In fact, it really is none of my business. That's between you and God. But I'm just, I don't know why. You know, I thought about preaching other messages this morning. And this is the one that stuck. And this may be a room full of people who are not criers, but can I tell you, God sees what you're struggling with when you walk out of this room this afternoon, when you walk back into the job force Monday, when you go back to your family reunion, you're dealing with the same struggles and you're hitting your head against the wall and your tears are pouring out and you're crying, dealing with the same situations. He sees you and he's keeping a record. Thou tellest my wanderings. You put my tears into thy bottle. You write them down in thy book. And God sees you. He loves you. It's not embarrassing. It's not shameful. All it says is that there's a child who needs my help. Can I tell you, God is waiting on somebody to say, I just need you to cry out. I just need you to say my name. I just, I'm waiting. I've got the answer. I've got the salvation. I've got the redemption. I've got my blood ready for you. If you'll just cry out. If you'll just cry out. You see, David understood. He said, thy vows are upon me. If we would go down in Psalm 56 a little bit later. uh, David says that thy vows are upon me, O God. I will render praise unto thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death. Will thou not deliver my feet from falling? David, now here's the difference, right? A lot of us, we're okay. (laughs) Some people are not okay with crying because they think it's shameful. And there's a lot of people who are who are okay with crying, but they're okay with crying, just, just sitting there and just crying, saying, God, I've been crying for a long time. I, I've been doing this for a long time, and I'm just going to sit here, and I'm going to cry until you hear me, until you fix my situation. But David is in the hands of his greatest enemy, 
He's on his way to their capital. He doesn't know if they're going to try to kill him or what they're going to do to him. And yet he has the gall to lift his head up to God and said, God, I'm crying out to you. And I know that you see my pain. I know that you see my hurt. I know that you see my face. And this is a bad situation. These people are trying to kill me. I don't have control of this. I, 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 this is so far out of my scope and what I'm able to do, God. But yet I'm still struggling. I'm still crying out. And he said, yet my vows are upon thee, God. He said, it doesn't matter what my situation looks like. I'm still going to raise my hands and sing to the Savior who saved me from death too many times for me to lose faith. Now, can I tell you, it's not enough just to sit and cry and wait for God to fix everything. But there's a moment where you got to say, God, it doesn't matter what the situation looks like. I'm still going to praise you. God, it doesn't matter how out of control I feel. God, I'm still going to render praises unto you because you've been too good to me for me to lose faith in you now. So yes, God, I'll base myself. I'll cry. I'll call out to you. I'll embarrass myself. I'll humiliate myself in your presence. You know why? Because I know it gets your attention. I know you're seeing it. And I know that you will make a way. Come on, somebody in this room, it's been a long while since you said, God, let me get on the floor. I need something from you. I need a change in my life. I need you to change something about me. They that sow in tears will weep in joy. Do you know that when the, the Israelites were coming out of Babylon, and when we read Psalm 56, they said they thought it was like a dream. They never thought it was possible. They had lived so long in captivity that they had a hard time grasping that God was actually setting them free. They had cried for so many years, for generations had passed in captivity, that they almost didn't believe that God was giving them a house again. They almost didn't believe that God was setting them free. And how much is that just like us? Some of us have spent so long in our shame. Some of us have spent so long in the situation. Some of us have spent so long in the temptation, the evil, the hurt, the pain, the, the, the betrayal, whoever hurt you, whoever scarred you. We spend so much time in there that when God is knocking on the door saying, I'm ready to set you free. I've got the healing that you need. I've got the restoration that you need. I've got the peace. I've got the joy that you need. And he opens the door of freedom. You've cried out. you cried your tears. And he opens. Sometimes it's like a dream. And yet they walked forward and they said, they that so in tears will reap in joy. Can I tell you, it doesn't matter how long you've been crying. It doesn't matter how long the sickness has been with you. It doesn't matter how long the shame has been with you. If he sees your tears, you will reap in joy. Saying, God, I go forth bearing precious seed. I don't have it together, but I'm weeping and I'm sowing my praises. I'm weeping and I'm sowing my worship. God, I'm weeping and I'm sowing my thankfulness. God, I'm weeping and I'm sowing my devotion. Why? Because I know one day God will look at that bottle full of tears and he'll say, those belong to my child and it's about time that they were free. I see the tears. I, I know what you said. I know what you've been through and I see you and it's about time that you were free. It's about time that you were set in peace, glory and joy. It's about time. So therefore, God, thy vows are upon me. I will render praises unto you. I will render praises unto God because he's been too good. The woman who cried at Jesus' feet, she wasn't there to impress anybody. She was there to see somebody who could redeem her sins. She wasn't trying to be magnificent. She wasn't trying to offer Jesus a great gift. She just said, God, I have nothing to give you other than my worship and my adoration because I know that you can save me. I don't have much, Jesus. In fact, I don't have a lot to give. I just know that you're with me. Can I tell you what? The enemy better beware when you start to cry. You know why the enemy doesn't want you to cry? The enemy is all right if you cry and you cry in private. Again, babies, as they begin to grow and they become more self-sufficient, he's okay with you shedding tears. He's just not okay with you vocalizing your issues to God. You know why? Because the enemy knows that when you get a hold of God's attention, God will respond to his children. Somebody needs to hear, you know why the devil's okay with you sitting in private and weeping your tears and crying without praising God? Because he knows that when you're weeping and you're crying and the times are hard, and yet when a child can say, God, this is hard, I don't understand what's happening right now, but you still get the glory, you still get the honor, you still get the praise. The enemy knows, oh no, don't you cry out to him, don't you utter any worship, don't you utter any praise. He can't hear you, he, you're lost, you're in a wilderness, God's forgotten you. And some of you have been sitting in the wilderness and you've been saying, surely God has not seen my situation for years. have been praying the same prayers. 
been given the same promise, been praying the same prayers, and nothing's come to pass yet. And then he's saying, yeah, he's forgotten you. But all of a sudden, if you'll begin to vocalize and saying, God, I don't care how long I have to wait. The promise would be worth it just one time. If, if I could just get in your presence, if you could just do it, God, I'm going to render praises unto you. You know, David said, it's when I cry, then my enemies shall turn away. Oh, it's, and all of a sudden, when the, the Israelites were freed out of Babylon, it said, even our enemy said, their God hath done great things for them. Can I tell you, it's all right to cry out to the name of God. You know why? Because the devil gets scared when you begin to call upon your Savior. When he begins to see the tears fall from your eyes, and those tears are mixed with a cry that says, God, I need your help. He understands that there is a child reconnecting to their father. And their father is saying, son, daughter, I see your tears. I see your pain. I see your anguish. And I'm going to respond because those that sow in tears will reap in joy. The music will come. I'm about to close. If this sermon is for one person in this place, it's for one person in this place. If this sermon is for all of us, just to serve a reminder, it's for all of us. I'm not with you every day. I don't see what you face tomorrow. I don't see what you face Tuesday. In fact, I haven't seen what you faced in the past 10 years of your life. But I do know that at every moment in a human being's life, we fall out of control. And things begin to spin. And things begin to spiral. But in our society, in this day and age, you've been taught to be very self-sufficient. And to never let them see you cry. But can I tell you, there is a heavenly father who is waiting for his child to reconnect with him. To redig the well. He's waiting for a child who will open up their mouth and say, you're right, God, I don't have this all together. I'm weak. I, don't, I can't do it on my own, God. And he's saying, see, now there's a life that I can operate in. He said, the more that I, you try to control it, the less control that I can take. The more that you try to manipulate the situation, the less that I can do for you. He said, but if you will be a child that learns how to cry out to me, then you have an almighty father. It's not just an earthly person. It's not a politician. It's not, it's not Superman. It's not some superhero that will call out for you and, and come save you. You have access to the almighty God of the universe, the one who spoke us into existence, the one who can do anything. And when you learn to cry out his name, Jesus, he responds. And for anyone in this room who thought that God forgot about everything you've been going through, and you feel like your service has been in vain, you feel like your devotion has been in vain, can I tell you, he has a bottle full of tears. And he has a book full of everything you've been going through. Do you know that each tear, because of all the different chemicals that are poured out into tears, when they dry and they evaporate, they actually leave behind patterns as distinct as a snowflake. Meaning every tear that you have cried has told God a different story. And he has seen them all and he has taken record of them all and he remembers every story, every tear, every hardship. And he's saying, if you'll learn to worship me through the tears, you will reap in joy. If we could all stand. Some of you are familiar with altar services. There may be some here who are not familiar with altar services. And like I said, I'm not seeing what's going through your mind and your heart. All I know is that God told me to come here and talk about this. I know that there's somebody here, you've been waiting for the opportunity to cry out to God, but you didn't know if it would be embarrassing. You didn't know if it would be shameful. Somebody in here has been coming to church week after week telling everybody everything is okay when everything has not been okay. So let's just pull the veil down. It's not embarrassing to walk into the presence of God and cry. It's not embarrassing to get down in his presence and say, God, I need you. I need your spirit. I need your glory. I need your power. Guess what? No one in this room has it all together. We're all weak. We're all flesh. We're all base. We all have fallen and come short of the glory of God. That's why we have an almighty, graceful God who said, if you'll learn to call out of my name, I will save you. There's somebody here. You may be new to church and all this may be very new to you. And it may be intimidating for you to come down to an altar and cry in front of people who've been to church for a long time. Can I tell you, it doesn't matter. It's not embarrassing. If you're new to this and you want to get to know your Savior better, there's a place in this altar where you can get reconnected with an almighty God. And if you begin to cry, that's okay. If you begin to feel something that's foreign to you, that's okay. If you want to weep before the presence of God, guess what? I'll weep with you. I'll cry with you. I'll pray with you. You know why? Because it's more important to me that you get reconnected with your Savior than somehow being in control or looking good this altar call is not about impressing anybody it's about getting connected to an almighty God so I'm inviting you right now 
whether you've been in a hundred altar calls or whether this is your first altar call, come to this altar and say, God, I need you. Change my life. I'm opening my heart. I'm opening my mind. I'm tired of pretending that I can control it all. I'm tired of pretending that I've got it all under wraps. God, I'm tired of I'm tired of putting on a mask and coming to church and acting like everything's okay. There's something wrong, and I need your spirit. Somebody needs to learn how to call and to cry out to God. It's okay. It's not embarrassing. It's not shameful. There's a God that loves you, and he wants to change your life. There's peace that's here for you. Come on, will you learn to cry out? Come on, there's people coming down to this altar. Tears are being shed right now. It's not embarrassing. But there's a God that hears your cry. And when he hears your cry, he will respond. Come on, his presence is here. His glory is here. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Come on, he wants to hear from you. You're his child. You're his kid. He wants to hear from you.
Hi, this is Pastor Kevin Martin, and I just want to thank you all for joining us today, tuning in and being a part of our service. We hope that it was a blessing to you and that you were uplifted and encouraged and felt the presence of the Lord. If you would like to know more about our church, please join us at www.atascacitaupc.com and you will find all of the ministries. You will find pictures where you could take a journey and see everything that's been going on at the Pentecostal Church of Atascacita. And uh, we hope that you join us again very soon. God bless you.